Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Shim, and I'm super uh, excited about today's webinar. I'm uh, Bank United's EVP and Head of Consumer and Small Business Banking, and I just want to thank everybody for joining us today um, to, to talk about the forecast of in a time of COVID. So I'm joined here today by Bank United's Chief Operating Officer, Tom Cornish, and together Tom and I will be leading today's discussion with our guest uh, of honor, Dr. Sean Snaith, the director of the University of Central Florida's Institute for Economic Forecasting. And with that, I will pass it over to Tom. Thank you very much, Lisa. We're uh, excited to have all of you join us today. This is actually our first week back in the office as a, as a bank. We have been out of the office uh, almost for two years exactly. So we, we've got everybody back in this week and we're excited to have people back in and, and it's great. The last <clears throat> two years have been obviously incredibly challenging for everyone. Uh, we have all learned a lot and you know we, we have constantly changed our plans and I'm sure all of us and changed strategies and tactical issues and meeting times and all kinds of things over the last couple of years to be able to uh, cope with what we've uh, been faced with and what we've learned in, in fighting this pandemic on, on our side. Uh, when we first got thrust into it, uh, the team was immediately engaged with approving 3,500 PPP loans uh, and funding them in a period of about uh, six and a half weeks. It felt like about four years worth of work stuffed into six and a half weeks. and. We were having two o'clock in the morning conference calls and 6 a.m. conference calls, and, and it, was, it was quite stressful. But at the end, we made uh, close to $900 million of PPP loans to our clients and, you know, in the process, uh, help to uh, keep, you know, thousands and thousands of jobs in our local community. So while it was a great deal of work, it was very rewarding to see the efforts go into particularly keeping small businesses afloat and keeping so many people uh, actively engaged in employment through this difficult time. But so now we're heading into 2022 and, you know, it uh, it hopefully looks like uh, the worst of uh, pandemic and and other variants are behind us. There's, uh, you know, other challenges we're facing, you know, a change in the interest rate environment and, you know, looking into the economy and supply chain you know, issues. I was at the port of Jacksonville yesterday and uh, watching, you know, cargo being loaded onto decks and learning about, uh, you know, what's happening in the auto industry from a supply chain perspective. So lots of uh, lots of challenges uh, are still out there and it's uh, a bit uncertain. Geopolitical issues are also relevant, obviously, you know, in today's world. But uh, uh, we're, we're pleased to have Dr. Snaith here who will help us figure out all of this in the next hour, and uh, it, uh, it's a pleasure to have him. He's a nationally recognized economist in the field of business and economic forecasting. He's the recipient of multiple awards for the accuracy of his forecast, his research and his teaching. Dr. Snaith has consulted for local governments and multinational corporations, and is frequently interviewed by international, national, and regional media. He's, he's had a broad experience and a lot of different parts of the world before joining UCF's College of Business. He held teaching positions at uh, Pennsylvania State University, the American University in Cairo, the University of North Dakota, and the University of the Pacific. So we welcome our uh, honored guest speaker, Dr. Snaith, and we turn the agenda over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, not necessarily my pleasure to be in another Zoom meeting, but uh, you know, I've added that to my list of four letter words uh, over the course of this pandemic. So uh, allow me uh, to, to try to share my uh, presentation here, hopefully without botching anything up. Um, could the host uh, enable my screen sharing, if that would be okay? Beautiful. Let me see here. All right. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, so it's been uh, it's been a remarkable uh, couple of years. Uh, certainly, I, I used to talk about the 2008 2009 
recession as, as the recession of a lifetime. Uh, but I guess I underestimated my, my life expectancy uh, because the 2020 uh, recession uh, was historical in a number of ways, but it was uh, also the deepest recession that we'd experienced since uh, the Great Depression. And uh, I, I would argue, and these are my opinions, not those of my, my offspring or my employer or uh, my, my neighbors or my church, but um, I, I would argue that, um, let me see, how do I advance this? Well, I knew that would happen. Okay, here we go. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, how did we get here? Uh, in terms of the economy today. Uh, you know, all of these major issues uh, that, that we currently face, um, inflation, the supply chain failures, the, the widespread labor market shortages, high oil and gasoline prices are directly rooted in the policies that we implemented uh, in an attempt, I wouldn't even say a successful attempt, in an attempt to contain uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, of course, uh, it, it was just mentioned, uh, you know, ge geopolitically things have also uh, heated up, but the Russian incursion into Ukraine, uh, you know, really is just some additional whipped cream and cherries on top to the of the banana split of economic problems we were facing before uh, uh, Russia made this move. So um, why did we do what we did uh, in 2020? I, you know, in, in, in February and, and really in January, I was, you know, I was paying a lot of attention uh, to COVID-19 and I started to, to do some historical research uh, in terms of how pandemics uh, affect the economy and, you know, the, the, uh, the, the largest global one most recently, of course, was the, the Spanish flu. And so I was looking back at that data in terms of how rapidly it was spreading, the case, uh, number of cases, uh, case fatality rates and so forth, uh, and who was impacted by that, uh, that pandemic. And COVID-19 didn't really look like that. Um, it was not spreading as quickly. Um, it was clear that it was a, a greater danger to certain um, you know, demographic groups, uh, you know, whereas uh, the Spanish flu really killed, uh, you know, people of all ages uh, and, and, and uh, you know, of all health conditions. So, um, you know, I, I in February, I, I wasn't uh, predicting a recession uh, in the U.S. economy, but I also wasn't predicting the uh, policies that were about to be implemented in, in March and April uh, of 2020. And those uh, policies were um, triggered, uh, I would argue, by, by a study uh, that came out of the Imperial College in London um, that made some predictions uh, about COVID-19, uh, one of which was that it was going to kill 2.2 million Americans that year. Uh, and when that study came out, that was sort of the, you know, hair on fire moment uh, when, um, you know, all of these measures that had not historically been part of, of you know, public health uh, attempts to control pandemic were implemented. Things like shutting down schools, uh, shutting down, you know, uh, quote unquote, uh, non-essential businesses. I'm not exactly sure who gets to make that designation. I think anybody's uh, business is essential to them. Um, you know, I myself, uh, until just a few months ago, had uh, hair down to my shoulders, uh, in part because my barber was closed for five months as being a non-essential business. During that entire time, however, my, my, my dog was able to go to the groomer uh, because apparently that's more essential than me getting a haircut. But anyway, he was well groomed. I ended up looking like a you know a, a refugee from the early '70s. Um, but those decisions, uh, which historically had not been done uh, in an attempt to to control pandemic, really inflicted a tremendous cost uh, on the economy and set off a chain of events that we're still grappling with today and will continue. Uh, in my uh, opinion, to grapple with through 2022 
and into 2023. Oh, there's a delay. So, uh, <laughs> Donna was a little nervous about this uh, th this slide, um, but uh, you know how how did we end up implementing all of these uh, these policies? And and I would argue that there's been uh, uh, over the years, it just sort of was heightened here with COVID-19, this uh, emergence of what I would call a secular religion. Uh, I call it Scientology, not to be confused with Scientology. Uh, this particular uh, religion as it's emerged is sort of uh, you know, polytheistic. There are many greater and lesser gods that, uh, that uh, we have to pay worship to. Um, many of these deities are, are referred to as experts. It's uh, experts say something. And if you question the experts or their predictions or their proclamations, well, you're, you're, you're a blasphemer. You know, you, you say you have absolutely no right. And, and you know, you, you have a number of these uh, sort of incantations and chants that we've, uh, that we've heard over the past several years, you know, follow the science, trust the science. The science is settled. Uh, she blinded me with science. Um, and, and so that um, really didn't allow us uh, to do science as as it's uh, as a philosophy, in which it's never settled, and and science is about questioning uh, results, uh, and 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 when new data comes out, seeing if the previous conceptions and notions uh, hold up to uh, to those. Um, uh, previous conclusions. And so uh, that study that came out of Imperial College, so I've been doing economic uh, forecasting in, in uh, academia and in the private sector for, yeah, geez, 21 years. I, that's a little depressing. But, um, and so I'm, uh, I have uh, been using uh, models, which are, you know, mathematical and statistical uh, equations or single equations that are used to uh, make predictions. Um, and, th and there's a, a late statistician, British, uh, George Box, who, who famously said that, that all models are wrong. Some models are useful. And what he was getting out and, and pointing out here is that um, is something that I, I learned my first the day of econometrics class in graduate school um, when the professor said that the true model is known only to God. So whatever it is you're trying to statistically um, recreate, whether it is uh, the path of a hurricane, uh, the prediction of gross domestic product, the spread of a pandemic, um, the movement of, of uh, a planet's climate, the model that you can you construct is not going to be the true model, the true data generating process behind the event you're trying to understand. And so, you know, when when my econometrics professor said that, uh, you know, he just basically was reminding us that that whatever we did going forward in terms of building models, um, they were going to be flawed versions of the true underlying model. Uh, and so that study um, is a great example of that from the Imperial College. Uh, you know, there, there's a saying in economics, you know, there's two things you don't ever want to witness being made, uh, sausage and, ec uh, and economic forecasts. And, uh, and, and the reason of course, is uh, if you saw how sausage was made, you'd certainly enjoy the final product a lot less. Uh, and the same is true with economic forecasts. So. Uh, I, having been in the sausage making business for a long time, was really curious about this, um, this Imperial College model and its forecast for 2.2 million deaths. And so I, I dug into it a little bit. I'm not a, a virologist in that, but I certainly know how models work and, and, and can work with data. And, you know, uh, models are wrong for a variety of reasons. Um, they're wrong because we don't include all the variables that should be in the model, or we include variables that don't belong in the model, or uh, the data that we put into the model is flawed in some way. 
And then all models uh, and all modelers and, and people doing forecasts make assumptions. And so those assumptions oftentimes uh, are wrong. And so I looked into this study and I cut open the casing on that Imperial College study uh, early on after it was released. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I think what they would call on that island really uh, kind of a piece of shite. Uh, it was flawed in, in many ways. Um, and, but, but nonetheless, it was taken as gospel uh, and set in motion uh, a tremendous um, set of consequences, the costs of which were never considered as they were being implemented. You know, any policy, economic or otherwise, um, can I go back a slide real quick? Uh, any policy, economic or otherwise, sh there should be a cost benefit analysis done before implementing it. You know, what what, is, what are the benefits or the perceived benefits of this policy? The, uh, that must be weighed against what are the costs of that policy? And so, you know, if the benefits exceed the costs, then this is a policy that you might uh, consider implementing. If the costs, however, are below, uh, or the benefits are below the costs, well, then this might not be the wisest policy. And so that cost benefits analysis was not done in 2020. This was basically a, a public health driven um, set of policies that did not take into consideration at all uh, the economic or other costs of doing these lockdowns and these closures and these travel restrictions. And so my lesson to this is that, you know, uh, from this is that, you know, experts should be on tap, not on top. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, you know, in some, some circles, I might be considered an expert. But if you're doing planning for Bank United, um, you know, the economy and the economic environment is going to be an important factor there. That doesn't mean uh, Snaith comes in and tells you how to run the bank. You know, I should be on tap. You take a, you get, get, get a pint of Snaith and set that on the table and incorporate that into all the other factors. Uh, that need to be considered in making your, your, your business plan and your strategic management uh, of the bank. Um, so we didn't do that. We put the experts on top and that was a, a mistake. And another lesson, another way to say, uh, restate this lesson is that, you know, be wary of experts that are using models to make predictions. Uh, they, don't, they don't know the true model. Uh, those models are flawed. There's assumptions baked into it. Uh, that can change the outcome. Now, next slide. So the shutdowns uh, instantaneously plunge the economy into this deep recession. You know, there, there was no question about it. This was not a recession that, that occurred like uh, previous recessions where, you know, generally it's from within the economy. There's a weakness uh, that, that, that starts to arise as we get to you know, the turning point as we get to the end of any economic expansion um, that, you know, sometimes that weakness is tipped by a, you know, financial situation, a currency crisis, some other shock, but, you know, there's inherent weakness there uh, as we approach the peak of, of, of the cycle. And in, in February of 2020, there was no weakness. The economy was incredibly strong. Uh, the labor market was in great shape. Florida's unemployment rate was at 3%. Um, you know, everything was, was, was going quite, quite swimmingly. There was a little, some issues with labor shortages, but they were more focused on skilled tradespeople and things like that, not the widespread spread labor problems that we, we uh, currently see. Um, but the decision to shut down so-called non-essential businesses to restrict travel, to close schools, immediately plunged us into the worst recession since the Great Depression. And the NBER, which is a think tank in Massachusetts, they're the one that uh, typically puts the dates on the beginning and the ends of recessions, but they typically don't put a date on the start of a recession until 12 or 18 months after the recession has started. Now you can insert your, you know, economist joke there, um, like, hey, thanks a lot, you know, 18 months after it happened, thanks for letting me know. 
But the reason they do that is that the data that we get from the macro economy, uh, GDP, employment data, uh, it's, it's preliminary at the beginning. It is subject to revision over time and to benchmarking. And so they want to have the final data before they assign that turning point. So that's why you get the big lag. There was no lag like that when they declared that the expansion ended in February and that in March and April, uh, you know, we had, we had entered into recession. And the reason was, uh, this was not your, your grandfather's recession. This was uh, uh, self-inflicted uh, in many ways, and there was no uncertainty about it. Shut down large sectors of the, of the economy, boom. There's no longer goods and services being produced by those non-essential businesses, and GDP falls immediately and instantaneously. And that's what happened. So we plunged into recession. Uh, when did the recession end? Well, lo and behold, when the widespread closures and shutdowns were lifted two months later. And so in March and April, we locked the economy down in part, and we, we, we threw the economy into recession. Uh, that caused tremendous damage. GDP in the second quarter uh, contracted at, at, at a minus 32% annual rate, just a dramatic plunge. Uh, we saw the labor market simultaneously uh, impacted. You know, if you're told your business has to lock its doors, there's no question, you don't need employees anymore. Uh, in a normal recession, the labor market lags behind what's happening in the overall economy by 12 months uh, at least. Uh, you know, when, when businesses see a, a, a slowing down of revenues, you know, the first action they take is not, oh, let's start laying people off. It's, well, let's see, you know, maybe this is a bump in the road, let's ride it out. Eventually, as the recession progresses, then layoffs and furloughs become part of the conversation. There was no need to think this, uh, you know, when, you're, when your business was shut down. Uh, and so we saw in a matter of weeks, you know, 38 million people just thrown into unemployment. Uh, again, unprecedented um, uh, in, in, in the history of the U.S. economy. Um, high oil and gasoline prices. This too, and as I said, Russia and, and, and the... Um, uh, sanctions that are being implemented and the uncertainty created by that situation has certainly um, accelerated the rise in oil and gasoline prices. But this was happening again before Russia, Ukraine. And why did this happen? Well, again, we got to go back to 2020. When you shut down large sectors of the economy, when you lock people at home, when you close schools, when you restrict travel, guess what happens to the demand for oil and gasoline? Well, it plummets. And so you may recall in, in, in March, um, oil prices actually went negative briefly because there was so much oil out there sitting on tankers um, waiting to be uh, offloaded that some made the decision, I'll pay you to take this oil off my tanker so I don't have to keep maintaining this tanker and paying the cost of holding all this oil on this giant ship. And so, you know, when oil prices fall as low as they did, how do oil companies respond? Do they add rigs? Do they drill new wells? Well, of course they don't. Uh, and so those, those rig counts plummeted. And so that set the stage. Now we lift the, we lift the, the, we lift the, uh, the, the shutdowns, the economy comes roaring back to life because fundamentally, again, it was in great shape pre-pandemic lockdowns. And so we lift the lockdowns, people get out again, they, they start spending, the malls reopen, uh, and there's this explosion of demand. And so now people are driving, to some extent they're flying, uh, and so the demand for oil and gasoline surges, but supply can't keep up. So prices get driven uh, higher, and that's where we were pre-Russia uh, and Ukraine. But it all goes back to what we did in 2020, at least the start uh, of this. And, and, you know, we're well over $100 a barrel for West Texas Intermediary. Um, uh, gasoline prices will likely go past the $4 a gallon uh, previous high that we saw in 2008. Uh, and, you know, we probably would have seen some spikes because of Russia and Ukraine in and of itself. But we were already at really elevated levels. Uh, the supply chain failures. 
uh, you know, before this episode, I mean, unless you were in logistics, you probably didn't think much about the supply chain. You know, it just kind of worked. Um, but what happened was that over the years, uh, technology evolved. Uh, you know, when I first started in economics, uh, inventories were really an important determinant of the business cycle. So businesses would build things uh, and then store them in anticipation of future demand. But technology uh, allowed for the, the emergence and widespread implementation of just-in-time supply chain management. So you didn't make something unless you had a buyer for that thing. So previously, if you make something and put it in storage, well, you're incurring all the costs of production, but you're getting no corresponding revenue. So that's not a real near-term profit maximizing behavior. So just-in-time supply chain um, management became the norm. And so that's what was in place when we did these policies. We, we locked things down. Some of the non-essential businesses were manufacturers. You know, you, you, you can't eat a computer chip, but those computer chips are incredibly necessary. So manufacturing was shut down in a number of industries. Uh, so there was no production going on. And so when we opened everything back up, all this pent up demand, all this spending that, that didn't happen during the recession, not because people lost their jobs, there were plenty of folks who were able to work through uh, this recession, um, not, not the lowest income households, they were disproportionately impacted, but those of us that could, could zoom their way through life uh, did so and didn't see incomes uh, terribly impacted. Uh, but we didn't spend the same way we would uh, in a non-recessionary environment. Then things start to open up and all the spending gets unleashed. Well, it runs headlong into the supply chain. So all this demand for cars and things that were uh, appliances that were, that were uh, you know, uh, delayed during the recession suddenly comes roaring back. The, the economy in the third quarter of 2020 grew at 34% annual rate. So there was just an explosion uh, of demand. And so now the supply chain, we've got to ramp up the manufacturing at, at, at the far end of the supply chain. So we got to start making those chips, those appliances and so forth. Um, but then that's just the start of the process. Once they're made, they have to make it through the rest of the supply chain. And it's that logistical piece uh, that, that we're, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, currently, all these container ships that are sitting off of the ports waiting to get in to dock to unload these containers, 75 or so, I believe, still sitting off the West Coast. Um, and so we're seeing the logistical piece now of this su su supply chain uh, constraint uh, playing a role as well. And so if that was just a one-time burst in demand, like, uh, you know, the doors are opened up. Oh my God, get me out of this house away from these people. I used to call my loved ones. I want to go out. I want to spend, I want to, you know, live my life again. Um, that would be one thing. But in addition to that pent up demand, we saw trillions and trillions of dollars of government spending from the cares act on, we were just dumping money into the economy, $1,400 checks is going out to whoever and whatever. Additional $300 of uh, federal unemployment insurance was spent. Uh, and this process continued throughout 2020 into 2021. And, and really even still today, there's attempts in Washington to continue to spend trillions of dollars. So we poured gasoline on this burning fire of, of the economy roaring back from recession. And that means that demand that tidal wave of demand just kept swamping over the supply chain. It wasn't a single burst and then things go back to normal. So the supply chain's facing ongoing challenges is what I'm saying. And until we normalize that spending, which I don't think happens till we get to the, the later part of 2022, the supply chain can't really fully get into, um, you know, catch up mode and, 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 and back to normalcy. And so, that's why you see, I mean, during the pandemic, which aisle had the bare shelves? Well, you could always count on toilet paper, which I always found curious for a respiratory virus, but well, what do I know? 
Uh, now you go to retail outlets or grocery stores, they're just random shelves that are empty. You know, there's really no rhyme or reason other than it just depends what containers get off of that ship and on the rail and on the trucks and to the distribution centers and warehouses and ultimately to the end buyer. So, you know, you, we're just going to continue to see these bizarre uh, absences, uh, uh, cream cheese. I, I don't know why you know, cream cheese shelves are empty, but they are. Uh, and, and so that's going to be an ongoing uh, problem. And again, all goes back to the policies of 2020. Um, well, inflation, of course, you know, monetary policy certainly created an environment that could, could, uh, could, could support higher rates of inflation. But again, pre-pandemic, the Fed was struggling to get inflation to its 2% uh, per year target. Now you got all this demand running up against, uh, you know, a constrained supply chain, empty shelves. And, you know, in our introductory courses, we sometimes describe inflation as too many dollars chasing too few goods. And that's exactly what we have. And we kept dumping those dollars uh, into the economy with, with uh, federal fiscal policies. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the labor market. Uh, again, you, you roll back to February 2020 and you say, what was the state of the economy then? And we were pretty close to full employment, if not there already, but you didn't see these widespread shortages uh, of labor uh, that you see now. And, you know, what's the difference? Well, again, you, you go back to the policies. You go back to the shutdowns uh, of a portion of the economy. You go back to the checks. You go back to the additional um, uh, unemployment compensation. And, you know, a lot of these shortages are in lower skilled jobs. Uh, you know, nobody, no hospital administrator is pulling their hair out saying, oh, I don't understand it. The orthopedic surgeons, they never came back after the lockdown. You know, they just, uh, they don't want to work. That's not where the shortages are. It's the, the, the lesser skilled, lower paying job where they're having difficulty finding people. And part of that is, you know, and I talked to my students about this, uh, many of whom were working before the pandemic and going to school. After the pandemic, many of them have not gone back to work. Uh, why? They said, well, I don't have to. You know, I got these stimulus payments. I got that extra unemployment insurance. Um, you know, why am I going to go back to scrubbing pots at Buffalo Wild Wings? Uh, you know, I got to pay for gas to get there and I've got enough to, you know, to, to pay my rent with my roommates and I'm not starving. And so there's, you know, uh, there, there, that's part of the story. There's certainly other issues. People are still afraid for their health, especially older workers that maybe were working pre-pandemic, you know, part-time as a greeter at Walmart or something that, you know, still are concerned about. COVID-19, and so they're not coming back in. Uh, but again, the majority of it is uh, linked to these policies. Go ahead. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, so we already, we already talked about this. Um, I'm, I'm, let, let, let's skip through in the order of time. I, I know I'm a little bit long-winded. Uh, and you see the consequences here for the federal budget. Um, you know, we are now over $30 trillion uh, in debt. Uh, in terms of our national debt, uh, the debt to GDP ratio, which is uh, analogous but not equal to a debt to income ratio that a bank might look at in assessing the viability of, of a borrower, um, is around 130%. It's the highest in our nation's history. The previous record uh, was just coming out of World War II when it was 107%, uh, but quickly came down from there. Uh, we're not fighting in a world war. Uh, and hopefully that'll continue, but yet we're running up this massive debt. And you could see the spike in spending that correlated to uh, the government trying to offset the shutdowns that were implemented to try to contain uh, COVID-19. And so this is something that uh, is eventually going to be an issue. Um, politicians uh, can kind of ignore it because, uh, you know, the crisis isn't here. Uh, and as long as it's beyond the next election, it doesn't much interest um, uh, folks. And, you know, we still have never fixed Social Security or Medicare. Uh, and yet we're just piling all this debt on top when we already have uh, unfunded liabilities that are in excess of $120 trillion right now. So, um, 
you know, Ernest Hemingway wrote and the sun also rises, uh, you know, one, two characters were talking, one said to the other, you know, hey, Bill, how did you go bankrupt? And Bill responded, well, I went bankrupt two ways, gradually, then suddenly. And this is how debt crises arrive. And if you look back 2010, the experience uh, in Greece, you get a taste of how painful uh, a debt crisis can be. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving here so there's time for questions. Uh, next slide. And the labor market, as I mentioned, um, you know, you can see uh, the labor market here in the 2008-2009 recession. You know, layoffs, the recession began in December of 2007. You didn't see immediately uh, businesses starting to cut payrolls. Uh, really until we got into 2008 and 2009, it was close to 2010 before we, we hit the bottom. You know, cut to the 2020 recession, this was instantaneous. You know, there was no, nothing gradual about this. And boom, suddenly, you know, businesses are shutting down, people are being laid off uh, in, in, in numbers and in, in such a short time frame that we'd never seen before. Uh, and so we're still dealing with that repercussion. Next slide, please. And so you see what happened to the unemployment rate as well. You know, the previous, uh, uh, the peak of unemployment after the 2008-2009 recession really didn't happen until 2010. Um, you know, the labor market lags the real economy or the overall economy. But uh, here it was instantaneous, it was simultaneous. Uh, unemployment hit its peak just as the recession uh, was at its worst. And, and those two things coincided. And so. The labor market's recovering, certainly. Uh, are we fully back? Um, not quite, uh, certainly not uh, yet in Florida, uh, particularly because of what happened to leisure and hospitality, what happened to tourism. Next slide, please. Uh, inflation. Uh, th this is, uh, you know, a lot of people were saying this is a transitory thing. Uh, and I think in part because they thought the supply chain might sort itself out more quickly. Uh, than it's, uh, it's been able to. Uh, I, I think inflation is going to be more persistent, probably higher than uh, what you see uh, in, in, in this, uh, this graph that was produced about uh, six weeks ago. Um, and the Fed is going to have to act much more aggressively, uh, I think, than many had anticipated at the start of 2022. Um, the, the real danger here is that the psychology of inflation starts to get deeper roots in the economy. We're already seeing wages and prices, um, wages and prices uh, interact in a way that uh, you know, they feed into one another. Um, sorry about that. Um, Cost of living adjustments are now part of the discussion and, and, and bargaining. And so when that stuff starts to get worked into um, the system, it, it, it's harder to root itself out. So for those of you that are old enough to remember the 1970s, uh, you know, wage price spirals were part of the economic landscape there. And inflation had really uh, got its roots deep into the U.S. economy, and it was very painful for the Federal Reserve to break that inflationary hold on the economy. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the early 80s, had to engineer an incredibly severe, and at the time, that was the most severe recession since the Great Depression, but it was the Fed uh, that had to implement it to stop and to break that hold that inflation has on the economy. So I think by the end of the year, the Fed funds rate is going to be in the one and a half to two percent range uh, if they're really serious about nipping uh, this inflation in the bud, because prices are not going to come down here in and of themselves. Uh, there's a lot of pressure because of energy prices. There's still pressure because of the supply chain issues that we've just discussed a moment ago. Next slide, please. Uh, let's skip that. Let's get, uh, we'll skip that. Let's get to Florida. Um, so I, I, here's our projections. I, and I, I, I will, uh, at the end of the slide, uh, there's links to, uh, you can access all our forecast publications at the Institute for Economic Forecasting. Uh, I think the economy is okay in terms of recession um, through the first half of 2022. I think in the second half, risks start to rise. 
um, as the economy comes back down to earth. The bottom row there, you see consumer spending. Uh, and so it exploded last year at almost 8% uh, annual growth rate. Um, that's still happening. Consumers are still spending here early in 2022, but that's gonna tail off and normalize as we get to the end of the year and into 2023. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk Florida a little bit. Housing, um, you know, one big difference between this recession for Florida and the 2008, 2009 recession is that the housing market was really central to the entire uh, recession and financial crisis, right? We had, uh, and you can see the, you know, the spike in sales at the height of the housing bubble here. These are single family existing home sales. Uh, blue is monthly, uh, red's a 12 month moving average. And this data is from uh, the Florida realtors. Um, that housing crisis in, in, in 2008, 2009 really had long lasting impact on Florida's economy. Uh, I would argue that while the national economy came out of recession in June of 2009, Florida's economy did not fully emerge from that recession until 2012. And it was the albatross of the housing market and the destruction of home equity wealth and foreclosures and all those problems that really weighed down on Florida's recovery. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so these are median sales prices for single family existing homes. And you can see we're well above where we were at the peak of the housing bubble. Now it took about um, close to 10 years for median prices to get back to that peak. But over the past three years or so, four years, we've seen really rapid price appreciation, you know, in the double digit range. In this next slide, uh, is the most recent uh, report from the Florida Realtors for December. Uh, and you can see there that, that median sales prices are up 21% year over year. Again, you know, this is for an existing single family home. This is in Bitcoin. You know, home prices aren't supposed to go up 20% uh, per annum. But these higher prices are starting to have an impact. And you can see that sales uh, year over year have slipped. Uh, affordability is, uh, you know, pricing more and more buyers out of the market. So you're starting to see uh, some headwinds in terms of sales. Why are prices rising so rapidly? You know, is this another a, a repeat of the housing bubble? You know, good old Florida man's doing it to himself again, uh, you know, causing another housing bubble. And my answer to that is twofold. The, the, the first uh, point is that bottom row. Uh, which shows you the inventory um, of, of houses available. So it's measured in months of supply. So that what this means is that as of December, 2021, at current levels of demand, the total inventory of homes for sale will last one month before it is exhausted. And so that's down from 1.8 months uh, a year ago. A, a real estate economist would tell you a balanced housing market has between six and nine months of inventory available at any time. So anything less than that six months, your local realtor would tell you, hey, this is a seller's market. Your local economist would say, hey, there's a shortage in housing. And in markets where there are shortages, you all remember what happens to price. Prices go up. The greater the shortage, the more rapid price appreciation is. So there's a real inventory issue driving a housing prices right now. And the key difference between this rapid price appreciation we're seeing today and what happened in 2005, 2006, is that mortgage availability, uh, we don't have the easy mortgage financing that, that was running rampant in 2004, 2005, 2006. In fact, um, lending standards uh, for mortgages have actually tightened over the course of the pandemic. And so the Mortgage Bankers Association of America puts out a mortgage availability index, which is a survey of mortgage lenders that they, they distill down to a single, single number. Um, and so the base period 
um, that they assign uh, for this index is March of 2012. So whatever the availability is indicated by the survey in March of 2012 for mortgages gets assigned a value of 100. So at the end of 2019, the mortgage availability index had risen to 185, which meant that before we hit the pandemic, mortgages were 85% more available than they were back in March of 2012. Uh, today, that index is about 125. So we've seen from 185 down to 125, a tightening uh, of mortgage availability. Just by means of reference, in 2006, that index had a value of 900 to give you a sense of how mortgages were being you know, tossed out like uh, candy at a Halloween parade. Uh, so we don't have easy money fueling speculation. This is legitimate demand, legitimate buyers running headlong into uh, significant shortages. Next slide, please. Uh, what is our outlook for the state? State GDP, uh, I think we're gonna see the numbers pretty solid, 5% plus. Um, this year, I think Florida is going to continue uh, generally to outperform uh, the national economy. Uh, I, I think that the 22, 2022 numbers are going to actually be higher than what we're projecting here. Um, the labor market is recovering. Leisure and hospitality is still not back to pre-pandemic levels. Domestic leisure travel, uh, I would say, is back, maybe even surpassed pre-pandemic levels. The business travel and the international travel to Florida are still lagging. Internationally, you've got a hodgepodge of vaccine requirements, testing, quarantines, all kinds of uh, hurdles uh, to travel internationally to Florida. And on the business side of things, you know, large expos and conventions and, and conferences, uh, they take time to plan. And so many of those were canceled during the pandemic era uh, and, you know, it takes 12 months plus to put on a major expo. Uh, and so that piece is still lagging behind, but they're all, uh, both of those lagging pieces continue uh, to recover. So I, I think we'll see sort of return uh, to full employment or to pre-pandemic pre employment here uh, over the course of this year. Next slide, please. Uh, again, yeah, I'll go quickly through this. I'm, I'm sure the bank will make these slides available to you if you, if you uh, would like to have them. But, you know, you just see these dramatic graphs that are, you know, not surprising, but they're still shocking to me to look at, largely because this was self-inflicted, uh, you know, in an attempt. And, and early on, I, I mean, I was shocked. I, I, I tweeted out um, um, and... and um, March of 2020, when these lockdowns were happening, I, you know, I, I was, it was making me think of the Black Plague. And uh, yeah, I had to take some history classes. I went to a liberal arts college. But you know, during the Black Plague, people believed that this was a, um, you know, a punishment from God, that people were dying from the Black Plague. They didn't know too much about back bacteria and viruses then. And so, you know, many people, uh, you know, would flog themselves, flagellate themselves, you know, beat their back to show God you know, how contrite they were for their sins. And so they've got a bloody scarred back and then they still died of the Black Plague. Um, to me, this was the, you know, economic self-flagellation that we were, you know, trying to, that we were doing to try to, uh, to appease this, this modern day uh, version of the plague. And so... Uh, again, I, 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 it, it's still as shocking as I, as I look at these charts, the, the impact it had on the economy. Uh, real estate product, this is GDP at the state level. Uh, I, I want to point out something you can see there. You can see the impact of COVID-19 and the lockdowns, right? But if you zoom out and you look to the pre-pandemic uh, path of, of Florida's gross state product, we're now uh, a, an economy uh, of more than a trillion dollars and growing. If you look pre-pandemic and you look at our forecast here, um, you can kind of see, you know, there's a trend here uh, that was not impacted by COVID-19. I mean, COVID-19, a pandemic is a transitory event. They end. 
Uh, but I was also surprised at how many people predicting that COVID-19 would change things forever. Nothing would be the same. I'm sure you've all heard the talk, you know, office space is dead. You know, nobody's going back to the office. We can all, we'll zoom our way through the rest of our careers. Um, and that's a great example of, of how wrong these predictions that, that COVID was going to have a real permanent impact on the economy. Sure, it knocked us off our trend temporarily, but the fundamental drivers of Florida's economy, population growth, uh, economic growth, those things you know, go hand in hand, are unimpacted by COVID-19. Sure, we went into a recession. Sure, you see GDP took a big hit, uh, but that trend doesn't change. Uh, and, and so the same thing with office space, right? Oh, we're only going to do Zoom from now on. No, that, that's not the case it, because Zoom is not a perfect substitute for in-person interactions. You know, maybe maybe work weeks and, and remote working become more part of the equation, but Zoom, WebEx, uh, all these things existed before the pandemic. And if they were so great and, 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 and equivalent of having an office or a classroom, then why didn't we eliminate those things pre-pandemic? Well, we didn't because they're imperfect substitutes. So that was a minor rant. Let me skip here. I know I'm getting long on time here. Uh, again, the labor market, just we threw so many people and these were generally you know, uh, people in the bottom 30% of household incomes. That's who bore the brunt of these lockdowns and these closures. Uh, and many of them are still uh, not recovered you know, despite whatever aid the government provided. Next. Uh, financial activities, uh, again, a lot of this you know, regulatory impact, I won't go too far into that. Dodd-Frank, I think was a, a tremendous mistake uh, or at least an overreaching uh, legislation after the financial crisis and, and really dampened activities in the financial sector. It hurt community banking severely. Uh, and I'm not sure fix the problems that it was uh, set out to repair. Uh, next slide. Uh, here you see hospitality. You know, we're talking about the end of this year before payrolls get back uh, to where they were pre-pandemic. Uh, still, still some lags there, as I said, international business uh, visitation. Um, but you go out a couple years and, you know, you could kind of draw that trend line to where we were and, and to where we're going. Uh, you know, Florida remains a, a, a draw, uh, despite the, the, the terrible PR that we get uh, in the media. Um, you know, people continue to visit and uh, people continue to move here. Uh, and these things fuel uh, our state's economy. Next slide, please. Um, this is new car and truck uh, registrations. I just threw this in here to give you a sense of how big that pent up demand was. You know, this giant surge uh, in registrations as the lockdowns ended. And I get my oil changed at the dealer and the lot at the dealer, you know, looks like the church parking lot on Tuesday. I mean, it, it, there's remarkably few cars there because there was just this massive uh, burst of pent up demand as we came out of lockdowns. Next slide, please. Uh, growth by sector here as we go through the end of uh, 2024. Professional business services continues to be strong in the economy, uh, leisure and hospitality. Uh, a lot of these growth rates are getting smaller because we're moving back and we're getting close again to full employment. Uh, you know, we had some really large growth rates as we came out of the recession, but that was exaggerated because of the lockdowns. And when the mall reopened, suddenly all these retail jobs came back. But, um, you know, Employment, the labor market's uh, muddled here. We passed Amendment 2, but now we're dealing with other labor-related issues. You're going to see more technology, more self-checkout lanes uh, in some sectors of the economy uh, that may affect job growth uh, in those areas. Next slide, please. I think that might be it. Oh, go ahead and skip that one. Uh, this is where you can find copies of our two quarterly forecasts, the national one and the Florida forecast. In the Florida forecast, uh, we have forecasts for all 22 metropolitan statistical areas uh, throughout the state. We also uh, have individual forecasts for the three divisions that make up the large Miami metropolitan statistical area. So for uh, you know, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, 
and Miami-Dade. So there's 25 subregions that we have detailed forecasts for in addition to the statewide one. And so with that, I'll shut up. I know it's almost time to end the seminar and I apologize for that, but I'll be happy to take questions and stay as long as uh, Donna wants me to. I don't want to get her mad at me again. Dr. Sink, that was um, that was very helpful color. I, you know, it is the top of the hour, and I know we have some clients on the phone. Um, we also have people not only from Florida but also New York, and I wanted to give actually Tom and yourself um, a little bit of time to just talk about. Look, you know, we clearly went through two years of, of hell um, through the pandemic, and but I do think there is some silver lining and, and some opportunities. As Tom said, you know, we're all back in the office at Bank United, it feels great. I think it's a sign of things to come. Um, but what would we, you know, what, and maybe Tom, I'll start with you, you know, what, where's the silver lining in all of this in 2022 as we, we think about, you know, what the last couple of years have been and, and looking forward, even in the face of some of these headwinds? Yeah, I, I will tell you, Lisa, I've had the, the benefit in the last four weeks of being in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, Orlando, Tampa, Jacksonville, Austin, Dallas, Atlanta, Boston, and New York three times. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, what I sense at the ground level uh, is a strong level of optimism from a business perspective. Uh, I, I think the two biggest headwinds are not as much labor shortages, but shortages of skilled labor in some you know, key areas. I think that the transition that some workers have to make from being in the hospitality industry to being in, in other industries is gonna take some time for that skill set transition to, to happen. But as we talk and interact with clients in every market, you know, we, we are seeing um, strong revenue growth, we're seeing significant investment in real estate, in CapEx, uh, all, all across the markets, you know, that we're in. Um, Florida has been gifted, I think, during this period of time because of the amount of people that are coming here, not just from the Northeast, but we also have um, to the south of us, the, the political, you know, currents in many parts of Latin America have been less favorable. Some elections over the last year have been less favorable. So we're also seeing a strong number of people coming into Florida from Latin America and other parts of the world. So Florida has been, you know, very blessed in my opinion, and I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on that. And in New York, we're seeing extremely strong levels of reinvestment in the marketplace after a period of, you know, probably a year and a half when the only people that were buying assets were distressed debt funds, um, you know, looking for deals. Now we're seeing, you know, very serious long term investors coming back to the market and making strategic investments in the New York area. And, you know, while there are some pockets of the city um, that are still, you know, a bit uneven, you know, by and large, uh, I talked to a an asset owner in New York last week who told me that, you know, he owns uh, 43,000 units in New York and he has one vacancy in his entire apartment portfolio. Whereas, you know, a year ago, the vacancy rate was 20%. So we're seeing people come back to the city, you know, in New York in very large amounts. And I think things like infrastructure spending, um, the, um, you know, everything that the, the federal government has done to stimulate growth, we're, we're starting to see significant pickup in construction jobs, you know, number of um, projects that are underway. So while there are certainly, you know, some headwinds, inflation, you know, price of oil and some other things, I, I would say not only myself, but across our client base, you know, we, we see a, a pretty significant amount of optimism for 2022. I would agree. Um, you know, I apologize. It's already over three at three. So I do want to just um, kind of wrap up the, the webinar. And Dr. Snake, just thank you for, for all the comments and um, the data that you shared with, with, the, with the group here today and, and Tom as well for sharing your insights. Uh, and I want to thank everybody 
uh, who joined us for, for this webinar. Um, and, you know, looking forward to a, a good 2022.